So without further ado, welcome to all of you. I'm hoping that everyone who uh, is trying to join has, has managed to make it in by now. Today's session, as the, as the title slide suggests, is Key Performance Indicators and Balance Scorecards. Um, and it's going to be myself, Marcus, and my colleague Mark Salve here talking you through this um, and how to measure what matters and delving into, um, into KPIs and balanced scorecards in, in a bit more detail than we did a, a few weeks ago. So to move us on here, the um, Mark and I are part of MKS FM, that's more Kings of Smith Fundraising and Management, and most of you have probably sit to the back teeth of seeing this slide if you've been to any of our webinars, because it's always one of our first ones. Um, but this is just a quick rundown of who we who we have in our team, because Mark and I, Mark heads up the, the whole um, whole business, and I um, join him on the, the finance side, but we have two other strands as well. So we've got Impact with Penny, Carl and Helen, and fundraising with with Emma and Dan and so between that we're able to get a really good holistic view of organizations um, and able to do some great work where we're able to tie finance and fundraising together or looking at fundraising and what impact you can achieve with that etc we're able to really bring those three streams together and now I'm going to dive right in because I'm aware we normally spend too long talking about ourselves at the start and that's not why any of you are here so we're going to Going to a few weeks ago, I say a few weeks ago, this was I think back in August, Mark and I did a webinar about management information um, and uh, all things management information. And we briefly, briefly touched on this particular slide here on um, drivers of your organization and measuring what matters. And that, as the title slide of, of this show said, was uh, what the, the subtitle of um, of today's one is measuring what matters and we touched on talking about you know are you measuring stuff about your pipeline of grants and contracts are you keeping an eye on what you've got coming up down the line um, how many service users have you got uh, your overhead recovery rate and things like that what are the really important drivers for your organization and and are you measuring them and how can you measure them etc but we only touched on it very briefly whereas this time is a chance for us to go into those areas in much much more detail and look at not only how to measure these but how to then present them as well um, and to try and uh, get a, a good spread of the important uh, measures for your organization and so now i'm going to pass over to to mark to um get us stuck into thinking holistically about strategy. Cool. Oh, thanks, Marcus. Um, so, so Marcus on the last page started to talk about finance and started to talk about what drives your numbers. And, and you notice one of the bullet points there said number of cats. Yeah. So at Cats Protection, what drove our finances was the number of cats we owned or the number of cats we neutered. Yeah. So, so that was one of the things that drove it. Obviously, there's a lot of legacies involved and money from fundraising, etc. But but actually, the spend, and in some ways, the income and the donations you get is driven by the number of cats you own. And so, thinking more holistically about organisations, and starting to think about you know the context of moving away from finance to thinking about looking at the numbers for everything is is where we're going to go next. So, if I can just move on to the next slide, Marcus. Um, this, this, is, this is quite a complex slide, but, but I wanted to try and give you a strategy on, on a page, yeah? This is PA Consulting, uh, their one-page strategy model. It's really powerful, yeah? And there should be a little copyright PA Consulting at the bottom here somewhere. Um, apologies. But the thing to, to notice, and let me just talk you through the model, yeah, is that all of these things are measurable and, you know, they all feed into what effectively drives the charity. So now we're not talking about finance, we're talking about performance. Um, and all of these things drive to the central box here, so saying key performance indicators. So if we start on the far left, if we start with the vision, the mission, the values, the impact of what we create, that top left box, you then have the outcomes that are, are part of that. In other words, developing enhancing high quality specialist palliative and end of life care services or sharing knowledge and expertise, and, you know, around end of life care services. So this is very much a hospice type environment. 
and St Wilfrid's, you know, you can see here the three different outcomes that they were focused on as part of their strategy. Within that, then, you've got the stakeholders. So the stakeholder groups that they work for and they work with, and all of the complexity, for example, of local communities, of the people that they work uh, with and for, you know, in other words, the direct beneficiaries, cancer patients, you know, the NHS, for example, etc. And, you know, underneath that, you've got your, your money, so you're raising funds and reserves, you've got your people and volunteers, the people that put the, the time and energy into, you know, making sure that the hospice runs well, and also gives good care to people at the end of their life. Um, you've got learning and growth, and you've got internal processes. So, so you can see that all of these things come together with the activities on the far right hand side here um, to deliver the work of the hospice, to deliver the work that we see. And so the activities, for example, could be patient services or communication, education or marketing. You can measure something around all of these things um, in this one page strategy. They, they can all drive the charity. Yeah. But whereas this is quite complex. Yeah, and you might want to measure something around all of these things. Let's break it down to the base. So if we can go to the next slide, Marcus. I, I, I like to think that when you're implementing a business plan, there are really only three things that matter. You know, you, you've got to have a plan, and that means that you've got to be able to see where you're going. You've got to have, you know, an idea of the risks that you are engaged in. And Japanese School of Management says you remove the barriers and you accentuate the positive and you move forward in your, your strategy. And then you've got to have these things, KPIs, to see if you're on target or if you're off target. Yeah. So if you go back one slide, Marcus, all of these things you need to, to measure somehow to see if you're on target, but not all of them are important. And so the key thing I want you to think about through the whole of this presentation is what are the biggest levers that we have to create impact? Yeah. So what are the biggest levers in all of this that we have to create impact? That's what we're going to talk about in the rest of this presentation. So if you can go forward two slides, Marcus. Yeah. So, so how do we know where we're going and if we're on target? This is what KPIs and balance scorecards and measurement of non-financials allow us to do. So if you just go to the next slide. Um, Kaplan and Norton were the first people back in the, I think it was the 80s to start to talk about this. And Kaplan and Norton were two academics. Um, they, didn't, uh, they didn't develop the balance scorecard methodology, but what they did was they did research into what makes uh, an organization and a specifically a nonprofit organization in some cases really do well. Most of their work was on commercial organizations, but they did step into the nonprofit sphere a bit. And they, they, they um, coined the phrase that actually, as we've seen with the complexity of a strategy, when you're actually flying a plane, it's really complex. With nonprofit organizations and, and uh, you know, charities, for example, it's exactly the same. We have dials in terms of the number of cats homed. We have dials in terms of the education that we're giving in terms of, you know, let's say, rehoming cats. We have guides that show us uh, whether we are actually meeting the awareness and bringing awareness of cats needs to the population. Or it could be, for example, you're working in international development. It could be the number of people you're bringing safe water to or how um, you know safe people feel with peace and reconciliation work so, so you know it's not just the money it's not what we think about it's all of the outputs and the outcomes we have as well yeah so Kat, Catlin and Norton started with this idea that you could you could create a balance of all of these different things so if we go to the next slide Marcus Kaplan and Norton said, if, if you're going to be excellent and you're going to measure what matters, you should measure these things. Yeah. They started by saying you should have an idea of your customer. You should have an idea of your customer and whether you're meeting the customer's needs, whether they're happy, whether they'll come back, whether they'll buy more from you. And, and remember, they were much more focused on commercial organizations. So we're going to need to change some of this language for the charity sector. 
they then said, look, we need, we need the financial, the top right box here, we need the financial, we need the funding, we need the picture in terms of our financial resources to be able to underpin what we're doing. And we also need an idea of the people resources, which they put under internal business, yeah? So in other words, customers keeping an eye on them, the financial resource and, and our people and internal processes that we have, that will drive our vision and strategy. But they said one final thing, it's not enough to actually just keep on doing the things that we do. Those that are really successful organizations really need to innovate, learn and grow. Yeah. So measuring this change, measuring innovation, learning and growth, again, is an, a really important part of being a successful organization. And it's interesting for me when you when you look at charities, um, the Charity Commission guidance number CC3 says you should focus on innovation and being generative. Yeah. And generative means having new ideas to help your beneficiaries for the future. Um, that is never more so within COVID-19 and the change that we are seeing at the moment. Maybe not growth, but having to innovate and having to do new things to help us and see us through this, this time. So this is a commercial one. If you go to the next slide, Marcus, we, we, we've adjusted this. Marcus and myself uh, you know, have adjusted this for, um, you know, for, the, for the charity sector. And I think this is much more pertinent or much more reasonable for a charitable organization if you're going to man manage you know an organization like a charity you've got to be thinking about impact right at the heart of what you do that can be that can be hard to measure but putting that measure about what matters right at the heart of things here yeah, is absolutely critical and then you've got your customers maybe your donors maybe the beneficiaries you work for but really understanding their needs and meeting them that is something that you have to measure and you know what Kaplan and Norton said is what uh, measures matters and and what matters should be measured yeah so so they were very thoughtful about saying right focus on measuring things so that you actually keep it in your your mind's eye and actually if if you're not on target you can bring it back on target yeah um funds available financial results you know I, I, I've changed the word from financial results to funds available because we, we have restricted funds, we have our reserves, we have to measure all of these things. Starting to understand some of the drivers behind that, really important. People, knowledge. I believe that people are our strength. We are a real people dominant set of organisations as charities. So people is, are incredibly important in what we do. Well, we should be measuring something about their well-being. Um, you know, appraisals, are we meeting the needs that people have? You know, what, what's our turnover rate? Have we got a lot of turnover or a little turnover? Let's, let's measure that. And then the final one is internal processes. Do we have an idea of our internal processes? And so I think breaking down a non measuring around it, and we're gonna to come to some measurements in each of these different areas, I think this is the critical thing. And, and so the balance scorecard, you could look at it in these five areas. I showed you before with uh, money, we, we've asked the question, what drives your money? We're now going to ask the question, what drives your customers and beneficiaries happiness, for example? Oh, Mark, we keep, we keep losing you. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I'll I'll quickly take over from him until until he comes back. So, as you said, we're we're moving this away from a commercial uh, initial commercial mindset and commercial language, and we are bringing this into a more uh, charitable way of thinking for charitable nonprofit organisations. How you want to describe yourselves, and so we thought now was a good point just to have. Um, a quick little bit for some for some questions or for some some points from from you as the participants in this and so the first question there if do you use a balanced scorecard we're going to hold off on that because actually i don't want to damp our powder we have a poll question towards the end for that but there is the what would you add to this is there anything that you think is missing from this balanced scorecard right here is there an area that we need to be talking more about um that, that we're not, I, I don't know, question. Um, and 
does something like this work for you or is trying to measure these thing, five different things too, too much to do? Um, so any input from, from yourselves at this point would be really, really great um, if you just type into the, the question and answer. So I've got from Gail here saying, would you make a distinction between employees and volunteers when thinking about the people category? I think I think absolutely, Gail. Um, it, it may depend how involved your volunteers are. Having a, a, a full-time employee compared to someone who, who volunteers a couple of hours a fortnight or a couple of hours a month may be a very different uh, level of engagement within with your organization. Um, and equally, you, you have to treat the employees and volunteers in, in different ways. Uh, there's the the aspect of training and monitoring and, and managing volunteers, which is um, potentially more hands on than you would be if it was a if it was an employee or or something like that. So so yes, I would I would absolutely be making this the distinction. And for some organizations, volunteers are are an enormous part of them take uh, St. John's Ambulance, for example, volunteers are far, far more numerous than than their employees. Um, grant and funder criteria for donations could be in the restricted funds comment. I, Carl, I, I, I think that's an, an, an excellent point there. And that could really be something that you look at when we start adding some KPIs to this here. You're on mute, Mark, but welcome back. Um, that might be something that you really look to, to measure in one of your KPIs. What is your uh, uh, ratio of restricted to unrestricted funds and something like that. So I think that's a yeah, that's definitely something for the um, funds and available financial results section. Um, we're just doing a bit of Q and A, Mark. Now that you're now that you're back. I, I was going to say I, that's that's the problem of living in the middle of Somerset. Sometimes <laughs> some somebody I, I I don't know a cow runs through the field and takes down the cable. Um, I, I was going to say, Marcus, I don't know where I dropped off. Did you did you hear? I took over as you dropped off. So you reached right. the point where you were just starting to explain how uh, Kaplan and Norton's initial one was a more commercial mindset and outlook in terms of its language. And we were changing that into a, to a more uh, charitable uh, framework here to make it more applicable and useful for, for ourselves as charitable organizations. And then we've done some Q&A. So cool. I think potentially uh, back to back to you. Oh, I was, going to, I was going to say, I was going to leave it to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gail, um, do all of these categories hold equal weight or should they be tailored to the organization's need? It, it, it's funny, Kaplan and Norton, um, you know, were very, very thoughtful about creating a balance. And when I was at KPMG, we used to live, we used to live on balance scorecards. I mean, this, this was our, this was the main work that we used to do. And we used to talk about this balance, uh, you know, holding equal weight. I've kind of I've kind of changed my mind on that since then because sometimes you want to focus more on impact than anything else, or sometimes you you know you need to focus more on the money. So I I, I think personally you bend the balance depending on your circumstance, yeah. But I mean I, I think I think the key thing is just getting a, a spread of all of your measures so you can really see holistically whether you're delivering against what you're trying to achieve or not, yeah. Um, the only other thing I'd, I'd, I'd say, I suppose, is if you're flying a plane and you're flying in in one direction and you go maybe one percent off off your, uh, you know, your bearing, you can end up hundreds of miles off uh, at the end of things. And so regular checking back on this is probably more important than the balance. And what I what I found is that the regular checking back leads people to question the measures, leads people to change them. And that's good. It's all part of that process. Yeah. So, Marcus, do you, do you want to take one or two more questions, and then we'll crack on with the? So, has anybody else got any any sure. questions? Yeah, here? we've got we've got a few more questions here. Uh, a really um, pertinent one from Andrew saying KPIs work with empirical evidence. However, a lot of ch the charity world operates in a more subjective world, emotions rather than facts. Does this undermine the model? Yeah, I mean, you know, our, our impact. Our impact uh, colleagues would, um, you know, would say that sometimes you can't measure hard uh, things, so you have to ask people. And you know, stakeholders and asking stakeholders their experience is just as valid as as hard numerical evidence. So you know, sometimes we we live in a in a soft world. But for example, if when I was working in international development, you would ask somebody in I don't know Somalia, do you feel more or less safe than before? 
and they say, actually, you know what, we are feeling safer. But that's a real well-being measure um, that will show you how much better they feel and what the impact of the work is. That's incredibly important. It might not be, it might not be very objective, it might be subjective, but it's still something you can measure. And we're going to come back to talk about proxies later on. I hope that answers your, your question. Great. Should we are you happy to crack on? Yeah, I think so. We've 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 got plenty of questions to come back to at the end as well. So we, if you've answered a question by now and we haven't answered it, we we will be coming back to these later. So fear not. Brilliant, brilliant. I'm I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so here's the rub. Yeah, for me, um, I have I've done quite a lot of KPI type work with with different organisations over the years, especially when I was at KPMG. And what tends to happen is there are hundreds of measures that are bought out. So we say, look, let's have a KPI, let's create a balanced scorecard. What tends to happen is every part of the organization, every person needs to have a measure which they link into. And you tend to get hundreds of measures and half of them are just not relevant and not useful and don't link to the key outcomes. So back to what I said as the key thing you need to think about, what, what, are, what are the levers, what are the key levers you can pull to create change, to create impact? That's what you're looking for, yeah? So you, in my view, you're looking for a small number of measures, you know, probably eight to 10, but let me tell you a story about British Airways. Um, and for those who've been on the CAS course, they're probably gonna get bored with this, I'm so sorry. Um, British Airways got in a set of uh, management consultants to help them with their key performance indicators. And after quite a lot of work, um, the management consultants came back and said, look, you have one key performance indicator. Yeah. And um, if you think about it, they've got customers flying on planes. If you think about it, the planes have to take off on time. If you, if you think about it, they, there's the logistics to get the planes in the right place at the right time. If you think about it, you've got to actually do all of the marketing to get people to come in the first place. And so what is the balance scorecard for British Airways? They said, look, none of it matters apart from one thing. And the one thing is the number of planes that take off on time. Yeah. So if the plane takes off on time, it keeps the customer happy. Plane takes off on time, it keeps the logistics happy. Plane takes off on time. We're enabled, We're able to market better because we can say that we've met the needs of, of taking off on time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so they then had one measure, and to enforce it, they got the chair to pick up the phone and to call when a plane left late. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. So they had one key measure, and yet they're a very, very complex organisation. I think that nonprofits are a bit more complex than that, that because of the nature of us doing some subjective, you know, uh, work and, and impact is is not as easy to define, let's say, as a plane taking off on time. So I think maximum eight to 10 is probably where you should aim for. And I'd love to hear in the chat whether people think that's right or not. Let's let's carry on. But I'll come back to that. So the next next slide, Marcus, is is just. Marcus and myself wanted to give you some KPIs that we've developed for different clients. Yeah. So, you know, I'll start this time with the people and the knowledge bit, you know, the bottom left here. Um, staff and volunteer retention, uh, you know, satisfaction surveys and volunteer hours and costs, all of those type of things you could measure. So, for example, through appraisals, are we getting the right quality of people in the right positions? Are they happy? And do they, do they understand and know what they should be, should be doing? Th those are key performance indicators. Um, internal processes, you know, the number of patients that fall or the number of incidents reported or the number of accidents reported in a lot of those that are CQC regulated, you know, like for example, HEKs, um, it's very, very important to measure that. Those are really a key performance indicator. I mean, Marcus, do you want to take one or two of these as well, or, or shall I just sure. be talking? Go for um, it. Yeah, so in terms of the the finance side of things, looking at uh, whether your income and expenditure is, is on track comes back to our uh, webinar back in August of um, activity of actual versus budget, et cetera, and monitoring that and updating your forecasts uh, for the rest of the year. 
your legacy and statutory pipeline you know if you're investing into legacies now you're you're likely not going to be uh seeing that bear fruit for for a number of years but how is your legacy pipeline looking um are you monitoring the the spend that you've got on that versus what you're coming in your percentage spend on charitable activities this is often something in the in the spotlight but for charities your your level of overheads um Keep it, keeping an eye on that and monitoring that year on year. Um, if nothing else, making sure that you you know what your percentage overhead is so that you know what you're putting in for your grants and contracts, et cetera. Um, go so, for Mark. If there's yeah, so, 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 you know, the final two that we haven't touched on, the customers and the beneficiary, you know, what is the take up of new and paid services? You know, how satisfied are people through user satisfaction surveys and, and also complaints? Do, do we understand you know, the number of complaints, do we measure it? Is that important for us? Do we resolve them on time? And, and then we come to the one which I think is the most difficult and the, and, and the key one here, which is charitable impact. And uh, from experience, I think you're gonna find it very hard to get one measure of charitable impact. Like the British Airways model, you had one thing that you were measuring. I don't think from experience you'll get there. I think you're gonna have two, maybe three. Um, and so, you know, here we've grabbed again from the hospice world, you know, percentage of people able to live out their life at home. In other words, having the dignity of, of living at home, um, you know, is, is something that's very important to certain people. Measuring that as, a, as an impact could, could be very powerful, whether you're meeting, you know, the objects of your charity and the hospice in particular. And then one from sight loss. I mean, increased well-being of people living with sight loss. Um, you know, how can you get that? Well, one of the questions here is how would you measure it? I'd measure it with a questionnaire. Mm. Yeah. Keep keeping it really simple at, at the end of having worked with people with sight loss and helping them through a charity's work, just ask them whether they feel more able to live now and 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 live on their own, whether they feel empowered in that way or or, or not. Yeah. Is there an increased well-being from that? That could be a very powerful key performance indicator. So Back to the back to the basics here. We, the first thing we've done is we we balanced out everything, so we've got a real balance of measures that drives the organisation or drives the charity. Secondly, we've started to measure those things that really matter, that cut to the heart of what drives your organisation, and we're also measuring the change that we're creating through the charitable impact in the middle here. Yeah. Okay, should we should we should we go to the next slide? Sure. I want to tell a little story. Um, now, if we go to the next slide, I can I can I can tell it. When when I was at Care International, we wanted to have a common purpose. We 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 wanted everybody from staff and trustees and management all to fall behind the things that we thought were important. We didn't have a common language, so we needed a common language to show what was important. And when we achieve certain things, we wanted to celebrate success. Yeah? We wanted to create incentives to achieve and we needed a tool for performance management. And so I'm going to show you on the next page. I mean, I've, I've, I've doctored it heavily, yeah? but I'm going to show you on the next page what we, what we had as a dashboard. So if you want to move to the next page, Parkers, this was the dashboard that we had, um, you know, and I've removed an awful lot of um, detail here and I've changed for example the staff retention numbers in the top left hand corner just to make sure that it's depersonalized but you you can see here we've got a staff measure in the top left hand uh, box um, in the middle box at the top we've got a progress against donor numbers and and those that we are recruiting through fundraising in the top right hand box we've got the top five strategic projects we're engaged in are we meeting those or not um, you know then risks as we go around on the right hand side, are, are we focused on the risks? Are we are we actively managing those unrestricted reserves, uh, you know, bottom right hand corner here and then, you know, some finance indicators and you can see the little smiley here, good or bad. Burn rates, are we spending the project money in the way that we should to get our overhead recovery and then pipeline performance? Is it is it good? Is it is it is it working well? Um, you know, are, are the people that have given us contracts and grants happy or not? We're, we're measuring that, yeah? And you can see here that in each of these boxes, we've got, a, a, let's say, for example, an orange and an orange, a red and an, and a, and a, and an orange 
you know, circle. And that shows actually the, the, the trajectory and the movement over the last four months or, or the last four quarters to see, are we moving things or not? Yeah. So, so let's take, for example, finance indicators in, in the bottom of this dashboard and finance indicators were orange, orange. They weren't doing too well. They went orange and then they went green. So you can see the pattern and you can actually start to judge whether we're getting better or, or whether we are struggling in certain areas. And the SNT would sit and discuss this dashboard and, and we would grade ourselves either red, we need to do, you know, certain things immediately, you know, orange, actually we're doing pretty well, but there are certain things that need addressing or green, everything is moving forward. And we shared this from everything from the trustees all the way down to the staff so that there was one common vision of what we were trying to achieve. It just really, really, really worked well, yeah? So um, the frequency was every quarter. Um, once we'd created the first ones of this, Harbinder and myself, we gave it to the staff and everybody in their own departments owned these different boxes. And, um, you know, at the end of having used it for two years, the staff came back and said, look, we wanna change this. Uh, we want to shape it, have a little bit more detail in some areas, a little bit less in others. And so we, we evolved it. Yeah. And it was and it was quite a powerful thing to, to have everybody involved in deciding what was important to measure. And it led to some really deep conversations specifically around, you know, the gender uh, agenda that we were working with across women in the developing world. How do how do we measure that? And where was the place on the dashboard for that? So we started to measure, for example, you know, a lot more about diversity. Next, next slide then, Marcus. So I think I've, I've kind of given you some uh, KPIs. We built a dashboard. We've thought about the idea of leveraging through what's the biggest lever we can pull to create impact. And we, we've also given you a dashboard. There's problems with that though. <laughs> Over Absolutely. to you, Marcus. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've got you know the main objection of we can't do that and we've specifically got a got a um a question here that's coming from cat who's saying i'd love to measure everything that we do in detail but we're a very small fundraising team tasked with bringing in huge amounts of income being so stretched i'm concerned that if we measure everything carefully we'll reduce our time to actually deliver what do people think about this and i think that's the point of um th this whole webinar of talking about key performance indicators it's not about trying to measure everything it's about trying to find what are the drivers what are the few measures that really really matter and capturing those in sufficient detail so as mark said that what's the biggest lever you can pull to to get the relevant the relevant data so are you are you particularly worried about your uh, retention of existing uh, donors is that something that you need to be particularly measuring or are you particular are you doing a big drive at the moment for new donors do you need to be measuring your um, new donor base in more detail than your existing donor base and so trying to find what is uh, most relevant to you rather than just trying to do a scattergun approach and me measure everything as much as you can is I suppose what we're aiming to get at here is that it's about the, the key things the drivers um, rather than just everything um yes so just because we cannot currently measure this does not mean we should not measure it um that the the idea of saying but we've never done that in the past is is not necessarily uh a means to say we shouldn't be doing it now or in the future um and i think having seen everyone have to adapt to online webinars instead of what used to be uh, in-person uh, talks and discussions at places shows how you know things have had to change um, over the past few months and and have been changing consistently for charities over the last decade decade and more so to say that just because we haven't done something historically doesn't mean that it's not going to be uh, better for the future and this is a chance to really go back and if you do currently use KPIs and dashboards to revisit them and to say, okay, are these still relevant? Are we still measuring the key things? Have we moved into a whole new different fundraising stream that we're not capturing in our KPIs or something like that? Have we got a new service that has new uh, impact measures that we need to be capturing? Something like that to, um, to be 
uh, revisiting and revising that to make sure that you are um, capturing the right the right information. If it's critical to measure progress, then we need to implement systems to capture this or use proxies. So yes, as this says, there, there may be certain things that at the moment you think are really important to measuring, but you currently cannot capture that data. And that may be something like um, uh, beneficiary satisfaction. At the moment, you're you're not able to to tell whether your um, beneficiaries are actually satisfied with with the service that they're using, or whether they feel uh, empowered or better well-being because of that. Maybe you need to set up using um, some sort of survey uh, system that you th that you currently don't use to be capturing that. Maybe you need to be uh, looking at a member of staff using SurveyMonkey in detail as a as an example. Um, or using proxies, the the very bottom bit saying talking about animal animal welfare, beneficiaries can't talk, so use proxy measures. I thought that was also a good chance to just very quickly put up a little picture of um my my little little puppy there, Maisie Maisie, who um I can see someone in the chat, Shirley Cooper, has also got a new puppy here. So congr congratulations, Shirley, and I hope she's just as cute as my one there. Um, the the example of saying in animal welfare, you the beneficiaries can't talk, so um mark's classic example having worked for cats protection is you know that they would they would neuter 150,000 cats a year how do you measure the satisfaction of a cat that's just been neutered um so needing to take proxies with that or uh the the satisfaction of all the pets that you've rehomed maybe the proxy you have to do there is to look at well how many of the pets that we've rehomed get returned to us um, because if they're not being returned to us, then the chances are that's because the both the new owners and the pets themselves are satisfied with uh, with their their new home, um, and so you may be able to use that as a as a proxy instead. The red, amber, green there. So instead of needing to to measure it exactly, going back to that that previous uh, dashboard slide that Mark had, using a red, amber, green green may be enough to give you a a, a feel. For how you're doing on certain things without needing to uh, quantify it specifically. Um, but I'd also be interested to know what other issues and things other people uh, see arising out of trying to measure uh, their certain KPIs that are that are relevant to you. So when we get to the Q&A, please do, do fire in with, with any um, suggestions or comments that you have in that as well. And I think, speak of the devil, oh no, not quite. We get to saying that KPIs aren't the whole picture. Um, so this is to say that don't get totally, totally focused on these, that yes, I said you shouldn't necessarily be trying to measure absolutely everything and be focused on the, the important things that you can measure, but just be careful that you end up not being able to see the wood for the trees. That if you become fixated on driving these certain KPI figures in the right direction, are you uh, still making sure that the, the overall um, picture for, for your organization is, is, is a good one? Um, so we've got some, some quotes here. Losing the complex and intangible can be dangerous. For every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple and wrong by Henry Louise Mencken. Um, yes, so it's not necessarily going to be a simple uh, solution to, to getting your KPIs and being able to, to measure them, um, but trying to keep a handle on those things that may be intangible, such as the charitable impact, um, and to really be going after that, that area, even if it may be a harder, harder measure, it may still be a really important one for you. Um, that KPIs can be a distraction from real incremental achievement. Don't give me performance measures and grand plans, just get better from day to day, said Charles Dunson at the Carphone Warehouse. And this is, I suppose, what I, the point I was trying to make about saying, don't get totally fixated on the KPIs and driving those numbers up, because in actual fact, in doing so, you may be causing um, damage elsewhere. So by trying to drive up your fundraising figures at the, the cost of everything else may mean that in actual fact, your staff satisfaction is going down and you lead to greater turnover of your staff, say. Um, so making sure that you're keeping an eye on the bigger picture as well as just those individual measures. And from Albert Einstein, not everything that can be counted is important. And not everything that is important can be counted. 
again, is just saying that uh, this is not about just numerical measures, that you have things such as uh, beneficiary satisfaction or well-being, which is something that you can't fix a t tangible number to, say, um, but that doesn't mean it is any less important. So very quickly, we've got two poll questions, which I'm just about to launch for you. Um, the first of which being, do you currently measure KPIs um, within your organization? So I'm just going to hit launch poll now. And hopefully that will come up for all of you. And it's just a simple yes or no. Um, and here we go. The votes are flooding in. We've currently got about a 70% of you saying that, yes, you do currently measure KPIs. And I'd be really interested when we get to the Q&A if, um, if um, those of you who, who do could, could give some examples of what you do measure as your, as your KPIs and what you see as the, the important drivers for your organizations. So I'll give a couple more seconds. We've had about 85 of you answer. So there we go. Okay, great. End polling. And if I share results, so you should be able to see that now. There we've got uh, just over 70% of you currently say that you uh, are measuring KPIs in some way, shape, or form, which is, which so, is really, really good to see. So, Marcus, I was going to say there was some work done by CFG Charity Finance Group about um, 12 years ago that I got involved in. And at that point in time, they did some analysis as to how many organizations were measuring KPIs. It was, I think if I remember rightly, 40 to 50%. So, so, so the movement, I'm gonna give everybody a huge round of yeah. applause for, for just actually measuring what matters and moving forward for KPIs. Those on the 27%, I'm not gonna give you a hard time, um, but I mean, maybe you could start measuring something um, you know, which which would actually help you to see. Yeah, mm. um, there's some there's some great comments coming in. Go for the second poll, Marcus, and then we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll so go. So, whether or not you you do measure KPIs, do you use a dashboard within your management information? So I'm going to launch that one as well for you now. Um, so, is your management information a uh, plethora of numbers and uh, comments against those numbers and stuff? Or do you have a dashboard sat at the front of that with the, the high level um, sort of balance scorecard or whatever it may be that you may use? And again, really interestingly, we've got almost the exact opposite way around here that it's currently exactly the same percentage split of 73% saying no, you do not use a balanced scorecard with 27% um, saying yes. So if I end polling there and share those results, you can see here, this is, yeah, a, a total switch to say, even if you are measuring KPIs and, and, and sharing those, you're not necessarily doing so in a, in a balanced scorecard. And so having something like that, um, a, a dashboard could be really useful for you to to give you the high level um, picture of information for for your management reporting that doesn't involve having uh, table after table, spreadsheet after spreadsheet, and yeah, sure, have that detail behind, but to to give um, management or trustees the the high level bit that really matters because often the the difficulty with um, giving giving reports or in-depth data as you know after the first page the majority of it doesn't actually get read um particularly on the on the day so that's that's really uh telling to see that the majority are are not currently using dashboards so we we've got some questions here then marcus here should we should we yeah. just should we just dive into the questions and let's see and then what we'll do is we'll do a summary and just and just finish there are you you happy to dive into Absolutely. the questions yeah, yeah. So, so the first thing, and pe uh, quite a few people have asked this, how does the balanced scorecard differ from the theory of change? Yeah. So um, both of them have great similarities. Mm -hmm. You know, so what we're talking about is we're talking in a theory of change as to what activities create in terms of outputs, create in terms of outcomes and how that links to impact. And then you're looking at what impact um, creates what outcomes what outputs and what activities this actually lead to, yeah? 
but but here's the difference with your strategy it's very much around what you are going to do as an organization yeah or what you are going to do to make the biggest change you can or or how you are going to as an organization change the world a theory of change is much wider than that a theory of change says look here's here's the change that we can make in the world from from the impact we want to achieve but we're going to take this slice of it yeah and we're going to focus our efforts on this slice and actually this bit over here is going to be taken by a partner or another organization or, or we we can't use our resources we're not going to do this so a theory of change is very good for helping you decide what you are and aren't going to do a strategy can articulate that but it's very much more about what you're actually going to do and there's another very good comment in here which is um you know measuring things um starts with a strategy yeah mm. abs abs absolutely you you know the the tricky bit sometimes is is to actually you know come and decide on um your strategy so you can then measure from that and what i've always advocated is at the end of your strategy process um getting some some key performance indicators to show that you've delivered your strategy starting to measure them and they will always be wrong yeah, you'll always evolve them, you'll always change them, but at least you start measuring something to see if your strategy is being successful or not. Yeah. So I hope I hope that helps. Um, do you have any suggestions for tools to capture this? I mean, I've seen, you know, Power BI. Um, I've seen, um, you know, things like Tableau, which is a fundraising device, but it's very good for plugging data into. But I just think the good old Excel actually is, is very powerful. Yeah. yeah. Um, Marcus, what what what, yeah. what have you found? There's a there's a great one here that says, "What about a scorecard for the external environment, considering the pestle structure? Organizations exist in an environment. If this changes and you miss the change, strategy can be defunct." So I think this is about saying that the balance scorecard doesn't necessarily have to be wholly inward looking, and that's not to say that using pestle may not be. Uh, totally relevant for for your organizations it's about what what works for you but i think to um have this wholly inward looking would be to to slightly miss the point um so to make sure that when you are looking at the uh customers or beneficiaries section up at the top left you may also be looking at uh what the uh regulations are that's happening in the environment for the customers and regulations or um when looking at, at, at people, you're also looking at stuff like, you know, happening at the moment, the furlough scheme and things like that, the job retention scheme. Um, so it's not just about what's happening within your organization and, and measuring that. It's, it, you may have feeding into those measures, external things as well. So I think trying to keep an eye on the on the external, you're, you're right, um, uh, Jonathan, is, is really, really important. So Stephanie, Stephanie Watson asked a really great question. She said, for smaller charities, some of the data sets we work with are also small. Do you have any tips on getting useful results from these smaller data sets? Maybe I'm confusing department metrics with KPIs though. I mean, Stephanie, this, this, this is interesting because you could, just, you could just take the decision that you're just gonna have red, amber, green. You know, as Marcus, as Marcus said, you could just decide that actually you, you, you can't really measure it with probity or the data set is too small. So you're just gonna take your best guess at things, yeah? So, so you could say that it's, it's red, amber, green, for example, and, and just, uh, you know, a group of colleagues could come together to give their best assessment. On the flip side, if it's absolutely critical, you measure it, yeah? So for example, uh, the number of, of people you've helped in an employment contract and you don't get paid until that, uh, if you like sort of number of people have been exceeded maybe it's a payment by results contract you've got to be right on the money yeah you've, you've got to know how many people are yeah. coming through that system and measured with real integrity so that you can tell whether you're going to get paid or not so it's, it's as the japanese would say betsu betsu it's, it's it's different things for different um you know organizations and different data you want to collect. But don't be afraid sometimes just to go with red, amber, green. It can be just as powerful as, as detailed numbers. Yeah. Um, uh, another question here from David Roberts saying, what should be the frequency uh, used to, co to collect this data? I think 
going back to uh, one of the points uh, Mark and I made back in the, the August webinar was to say that it, it depends for different things. So one of the examples we gave back then was monitoring your cash flow. If you have heaps and heaps of cash in the bank, maybe you're not needing to monitor it on, on such a regular basis. But if your cash is very tight, you might be monitoring on a week or even day by day basis. So certain uh, KPIs that you have may be ones that you're monitoring on a, on a long term trajectory. Um, and so be measuring on a less frequent basis, whereas others you may be wanting to measure more and more frequently. And I know that's not a terribly uh, useful or specific answer there, David, but it, I think it depends what it is that you are um, are measuring for those particular KPIs um, and and whether they are, are things that maybe are moving very, very frequently and rapidly versus things that are a longer term trend or change. So. I'm going to, I, th I think we'll take two more questions. Well, one, one from myself, Marcus, and one, one from yourself, and then we'll just wrap up. Yeah. Um, Pierre Dubois, this is, this is a really complex question that Pierre has, has asked. I think it's a, it's a really good question. Given that KPIs should measure how we're doing against our strategy and objectives, how can we benchmark effectively against partner charities operating in our space? Wow. Um, this is a really good this is a really good question and there's there's three different things we need to we need to think about the first is i've always believed in the power of charities sharing and coming together so for example when i was working with care international we used to have the dec to share some of this data with um you know when we were talking about animal welfare you have the associations of dogs and cats homes that comes together to share you know, some of this data. And I think that benchmark clubs are incredibly powerful ways to share in a safe way some of the data we have as nonprofit. Yeah. The second thing is social investment. In the social investment world, there's there's been a lot of conversation around how do we measure things. And there's been initiatives like IRIS um, that have been set up. That's not E-I-R-I-S. It's it's I I think it's I-R-I-S, which is uh, creating a platform where you can share some of the measures you have. And Big Society Capital has started to really share some of the measures because it, they want others to be able to share the data, share the knowledge, all of those things. So I, th I think that the social investment world has started to share those things. But Pierre, I think the biggest thing is just reach out with some of your data. I think we have a, I think we have a transparency here. And if we're able to start to say in our reports and accounts, and for example, as finance professionals, if we start to be able to put some of that detail into our reports and accounts, it will bring it to life to show the general public or, or our donors what we think is important. Yeah, That might be very scary to share some of that data, but it's very powerful in terms of transparency. I hope, I hope, that, I hope that helps you, Pierre. Um, yeah. Marcus. So my last question is one from Alison saying, some of the difficulty can be agreeing on what the aim is, e.g. we have a KPI for the percentage of people we care for who die at home. Same issue with staff turnover. What advice do you have for agreeing the number we aim for? So I think here it's about giving context to those numbers. Um, so you're not necessarily simply talking about a, a hard percentage. Um, in terms of, for example, the uh, percentage of people able to, to die at home. You, you may be going back to the red, amber, green to, to show, okay, is this a percentage that is improving or is it a percentage that is, is decreasing? And monitoring that and giving it, so you're not just having one hard number, you're giving context to that hard number to go, okay, well, is that a trend that is moving up? Is that a trend that's moving down? Uh, why may, may that be happening? Um, and it, it's not necessarily about saying that you have a percentage that you're that you're aiming for. I think for something like that, you would probably say that you're aiming for 100 percent there. So to, to be giving yourself a, a, an artificial target is something that would almost uh, not be uh, right as an organization that is presumably aiming for everyone to be able to, to, to die in their own home or something like that, or the percentage of staff turnover. Ideally, you don't want any of your staff to be leaving because assuming you've got the, the right staff with the right skill sets, etc. So I think to potentially be giving yourself 
um, targets there may not necessarily be that helpful. But I think, for example, with staff turnover, as it as that decreases and decreases, if you're managing to keep your staff, you'll probably reach a stage where you feel comfortable yourself. You you feel within yourself that you're no longer trying to drive that percentage down, that you've reached a, a place that you feel comfortable and happy with. And that almost answers the question for you while being able to monitor that trend on a um, on a, on a longer term basis. Is it improving? Is it getting worse? Um, something like that. So not everything necessarily needs a specific target that you're aiming for. Whereas with fundraising, you may know um, we are aiming to raise X figure that you're working towards. That can be much more concrete. So so we, we've come to the end of the session. Um, I'm, I'm just going to summarize what we've 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 said. Mm -hmm. um, the, the first thing is measure something. Yeah. Um, you know, really, in terms of a balanced scorecard measuring, you know, as Kaplan and Norton said, what do your customers and beneficiaries want and need is the most important thing for me. And that leads to the impact of what we have, um, you know, the internal a uh, bit around finance resources, our people, those are critical. And then the internal process as to how we how we do things and also the risk elements. You know, you can see that if you balance and, and get a nice, if you like, balance of all of these measures, it's in, it's incredibly important. Um, the final thing for me is don't 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 worry, create some measures, put them out there, and they will undoubtedly be changed. People, people want to think through and as soon as you put them out there somebody will question it and will change things don't be afraid with that yeah um create something and then let the conversation take place and as we did at care sharing that across the organization really transformed everybody's understanding and we were all then pulling in the same direction so over to you just to, to finish off then marcus great so this and the we've had a few questions saying you know will these slides be sent around and they they will be sent around afterwards so that for example on this page here this is all full of hyperlinks and stuff that you currently obviously are unable to click on but when this gets sent around you'll be able to click through to all of the the links here um there's lots coming up um we have a, another uh, few webinars coming up our next one will be an impact one on the 22nd of october um when is it a good time to measure impact or does it seem like an itch you don't want to scratch? Um, a yeah, rather delightful title there from, from my colleagues, um, but that will no doubt be a, be a really interesting one. As, as we've talked about in this one, impact, keeping that at the heart of what you're doing. After all, we are organizations that, that exist to try and um, serve our beneficiaries or create some form of positive impact out there. Keeping, keeping on top of that. Um, is really important. Uh, the 12th of November is a is a watch this space. We're going to be doing learning from lockdown and um, coming across some of the the key learnings that we've um, uh, learned from from ourselves and also out in the uh, with our with our clients um, over the past six months or or more um, and some key learnings from that and from others within the not for profit space. On the 26th of November, what will fundraising look like in 2021? Uh, trying to get, guess a, a roadmap for the future. Um, what is fundraising going to be looking like once we potentially start coming out of this uh, uh, coronavirus pandemic situation? Um, and then there's a building financial sustainability course, which is being run in partnership with the business school that Mark is lecturing on. That is a um, very interesting uh, and worthwhile course. I'm sure a number of the people attending this have already already been on it. Um, and yes, on the on the right are a whole load of, of useful links for, for for you to to click through at your own leisure. Um, so I think all that's left is to say, from Mark and I, thanks so much for for joining us. And at the at the bottom there, do get in touch if you um have any any questions or we didn't get to your question and you want to want us to answer it. Get in touch with us at the bottom there on MKSFM Advisors at mks.co.uk and we'll be more than happy to to um to reply to you so all that's left is me to say thank you very much thank you <laughs> and there we go and i thank you from mark as well <laughs> goodbye <laughs>